to mention the anxiety of the age. That's a deep cultural moment for us, not as politicians, but as Americans. That nervous feeling that you need to check your phone throughout the day. That's something that is now a cultural occurrence for all of us, especially members of Congress, most of whom in this room are doing that right now. <laughs> There's a lot of anger out there, and now it's being directed at the architects of this system. That's why you're here, Mr. Zuckerberg. That's why you're here today. You are one of the titans of what we call the digital age. There's an enormous amount of responsibility, an enormous weight based off the innovation that you've wrought. And maybe it's not about Libra. It's not just about some housing ads, no. And maybe it's not really even about Facebook at all. It's that larger question. And fair or not fair, you're here today to answer for the digital age. But of course, you're not America's first innovator, and we hope you're not America's last. This is not the first time that America has faced difficult questions about technology. Sadly, throughout the history of innovation, a major theme is the exploitation of fear. Politicians, enabled by special interests and a lack of understanding of new technology, use fear to justify what is ultimately a power grab. New laws, new regulation, but ultimately old and tired ways to centralize power here in Washington or other systems of government. Some of this has led in the past to comical results, and we hope to avoid it now. But just as one example, there was a time when legislators pushed for what was then called red flag laws which required vehicles, so-called horseless carriages of that age, to immediately stop on the side of the road and disassemble the automobile until equestrians or livestock was sufficiently pacified. But, uh, but other times in history, the use of fear was not so funny. Our last hearing on Libra, for example, was a moment when members of Congress on this dais actually compared the technology that technology of Libra to the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Will the gentleman yield? Look, I have my own You're qualms about Facebook nice comment. and Libra. Will the gentleman yield? The time belongs to the gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you for taking the bait. Look, I have my qualms about Facebook and Libra. I do. And the shortcomings of big tech. There are many, yes, there are. But if history has taught us anything, it's better to be on the side of American innovation, competition, and most importantly, the freedom to build a better future for all of us. Progress is not preordained. And American progress and American domination of free speech and global rights is not preordained. Let us not forget that the wave of innovation is spreading across the world, with or without us. So that's why I believe that American innovation is on trial this day in this hearing. And the question is, are we going to spend our time trying to devise ways for government planners to centralize and control as to who, when, and how innovators can innovate? Or will we spend time contemplating and leading the way on the question of whether or not It'll be American innovation that leads the next century. Being led by American values, the notion that we have of the rule of law and free speech rights and American-driven jobs and innovation. Are we going to spend our time building a brighter future for Americans or trying to tear each other apart? I yield back. I'd like to welcome today's witnesses. Oh, actually, we only have one, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Facebook. This is Mr. Zuckerberg's first appearance before this committee, but I believe that Mr. Zuckerberg needs no introduction. Mr. Zuckerberg, without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. At that time, I would ask you to wrap up your testimony. 
so we can be respectful of the committee member's time. Mr. Zuckerberg, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, uh, Ranking Member McHenry, and, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As we sit here, there are more than a billion people around the world who don't have access to a bank account, but could through mobile phones if the right system existed. And that includes more than 14 million people right here in the U.S. Being shut out of the financial system has real consequences for people's lives, and it's often the most disadvantaged people who pay the highest price. People pay far too high a cost and have to wait far too long to send money home to their families abroad. The current system is failing them. The financial industry is stagnant, and there is no digital financial architecture to support the innovation that we need. I believe that this problem can be solved, and Libra can help. The idea behind Libra is that sending money should be as easy and secure as sending a message. Libra will be a global payment system, fully backed by a reserve of cash and highly liquid assets. Now, I believe that this is something that needs to get built, but I get that I'm not the ideal messenger for this right now. You know, we've faced a lot of issues over the past few years, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who wish it were anyone but Facebook who were helping to propose this. But there's a reason that we care about this, and that's because Facebook is about putting power in people's hands. Our services already give people a voice to express what matters to them and to build businesses that create opportunity. Giving people control of their money is important too, and a simple, secure, and stable way to transfer money is empowering. Over the long term, if this means that more people transact on our platforms, that'll be good for our business. But even if it doesn't, I still think this could help people everywhere. Before we move forward, there are important risks that need to be addressed. There are questions about financial stability, fighting terrorism, and more, and I'm here today to discuss those risks and how we plan to address them. But I also hope that we get a chance to talk about the risks of not innovating. Because while we debate these issues, the rest of the world isn't waiting. China is moving quickly to launch a similar idea in the coming months. Libra is going to be backed mostly by dollars, and I believe that it will extend America's financial leadership around the world, as well as our democratic values and, and oversight. But if America doesn't innovate, our financial leadership is not guaranteed. I actually don't know if Libra is going to work, uh, but I believe that it's important to try new things, and as, as long as you're doing so responsibly. That's what has made America successful, and it's why our tech industry has led the world. So we co-wrote a white paper to put this idea out into the world and to start a conversation with regulators and experts and governments. And today's hearing is an important part of that process. What we're discussing today is too important for any single company to undertake on its own. And that's why we helped to found the Libra Association. It's a coalition of 21 companies and nonprofits that are working to give everyone access to financial tools. But even though the Libra Association is independent and we don't control it, I want to be clear. Facebook will not be a part of launching the Libra payment system anywhere in the world, even outside the U.S., until the U.S. regulators approve. Last time I testified before Congress, I, I talked about taking a broader view of our responsibility, and that includes making sure our services are used for good and preventing harm, and I want to discuss uh, that across other aspects of our work today as well. People shouldn't be discriminated against on any of our services. We have policies in place to prevent hate speech and remove harmful content, but discrimination can also show up in how ads are targeted and shown too. As part of a settlement with civil rights groups, uh, we've banned advertisers from using age, gender, or zip codes to target housing, employment, or credit opportunities, and we've limited interest-based targeting for these ads too. This is part of our commitment to support civil rights and, and prevent discrimination. I also know that we need more diverse perspectives in our company. Diversity leads to better decisions and better services for our community. We've made diversity a priority in hiring, and we've also made a commitment that within five years, more than 50% of our workforce will be women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups. We've made some progress here. You know, there, there are more people of color, women in technical and business roles, and underrepresented people in leadership at Facebook now. But I know that we still have a long way to go. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry and members of the committee, this has been a challenging few years for Facebook. 
I recognize that we play an important role in society and have unique responsibilities because of that. And I feel blessed to be in a position where we can make a difference in people's lives. And for as long as I'm here, I'm committed to using our position to push for big ideas that I believe can help empower people. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. It is no secret that Facebook allowed Russia to undermine and divide our country through divisive online ads. The Senate's investigation discovered that African Americans were targeted the most by Russia, specifically in places <clears throat> where Black Lives Matter groups were the most active. Despite all of your technological expertise, Russia and Iran are at it again for the upcoming election. Then last week, you announced a new ad policy that gives politicians a license to lie so you can earn more money off this division, I suppose. Facebook changes the rules when it can benefit itself. Last year, Facebook banned all cryptocurrency ads on its platform because, and I quote, they are frequently associated with misleading or deceptive promotional practices, quote, unquote. Seems fair. Then earlier this year, Facebook rolled back the cryptocurrency ad ban, bought a blockchain company, and announced its own cryptocurrency. So tell us what changed. How did cryptocurrency go from being misleading and deceptive last year and then becomes a means for financial inclusion this year? It seems to me that you shifted your stance because you realize that you can use your size and your users' data to dominate the cryptocurrency market. You change your policy when it benefits you. You reinstated cryptocurrency ads because you had plans to start your own cryptocurrency. So this brings me back to your new policy on political speech. My question to you is, how does this new policy benefit you? Because it seems that a policy that allows politicians to lie, mislead, and deceive would also allow Facebook to sell more ads to those politicians, thus making your company more money. But you can tell me, how does Facebook benefit? Chairwoman, thanks for, for those questions. Um, I'd like to address all of the things that, that, you, that you mentioned in there. On, on elections, uh, you're right that in 2016, we were on our back foot in terms of preventing Russia from, from attempting to interfere in our elections. We've spent a lot of the last few years building systems that are more sophisticated than any other company has at this point, and frankly, a lot of governments too, uh, for defending against foreign interference. Uh, this Monday, we announced that we had proactively identified uh, a network of, of, of uh, fake Russian accounts and a few networks of Iranian uh, fake accounts that we proactively took down, which uh, certainly, as you say, signals that uh, these nation states are still attempting to interfere, but I hope will also give us some confidence that our systems are now more sophisticated to proactively identify and, and address these things. On your question about uh, political ads, uh, Look, from a business perspective, uh, the very small percent of our business that is made up of political ads does not come anywhere close to justifying the controversy that this incurs for our company. So this really is not about money. Uh, this is, on, on principle, I believe in giving people a voice. I believe that ads can be an important part of voice. Uh, I, I think especially in the political process for challenger candidates, uh, and for local candidates or advocacy groups whose message might not otherwise be covered by the media. Um, having ads can be an important way to uh, inject your message into the into Let the Let me interrupt debate. you for a minute. Are you telling me, I think as you said to me before, you plan on doing no fact-checking on political ads? Uh, Chairwoman, our, our policy is that we do not fact-check politicians' speech. And the reason for that is that we believe that in a democracy, it is important that people can see for themselves what politicians are saying. Political speech is some of the most scrutinized speech already in the world. Do you um, fact check on any ads at all? Uh, yes. Describe what you fact check on. Well, Chairwoman, actually, uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Facebook itself actually does not, check, does not fact check. 
What we do is, we have feedback that, that people in our community don't want to see viral hoaxes or, or, or kind of so widespread. So let me be clear, you do no fact checking on any ads, is that correct? Uh, Chairwoman, what we do is we work with uh, a set of independent fact checkers who... Somebody fact checks on ads. You, have, you contract with someone to do that, is that right? Uh, Chairwoman, yes. And tell me, who is it? that they fact-checked on? Uh, Chairwoman, what we do is when content is getting a lot of distribution and is flagged uh, by members of our community or by our technical systems, it can go into a queue to be reviewed by a set of independent fact-checkers. Uh, they can't fact-check everything, but the things that they get to, and, and, and if they okay. mark something as false, then we... All right, my time has expired, and someone else will continue on this line of questioning. And I now... Um, Call on the gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member, Mr. McHenry, to be recognized for five minutes. So as I mentioned in my opening statement, I think there are bigger challenges and opportunities facing America than uh, your ad model, um, or even the question of Libra. So let, let's start with your speech last week. Um, have you changed your view in terms of uh, technology and China uh, from uh, before your speech on Friday uh, to what we uh, read and heard from your speech on Friday? Uh, Congressman, no, I have not changed my views in the last week. I, no, no, no. Uh, 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 ten years ago versus oh. today on your view of China and technology versus your speech on Friday. Uh, Congressman, I think it's fair to say that my views have evolved. I, I probably ten years ago would have been more optimistic that trying to work in China uh, could have contributed to making a more open society and today it seems that in some cases working in China um, not only does not do that but compromises American companies ability to promote our values abroad and around the world and I think we've seen that um, in the last few weeks uh, in, in a number of cases. So you mentioned uh, in your speech you said a decade ago 10 of 10 uh, of the top uh, uh, companies on the internet were American now six of ten are Chinese. So the question I have for you is why are we seeing emerging technologies driven by blockchain uh, projects and digital currencies being developed elsewhere, such as the case of Libra? Uh, well, Congressman, we have a lot of competition around the world. And, and you're right that over the last decade, Pretty much all of the major internet platforms have been American companies with strong free expression values. And I just think that there's no guarantee that that is the state of the world going forward. Today, six of the top ten companies are coming out of China um, and, and, and certainly do not share our values on things like expression. So, so on that, uh, why Switzerland for Libra? Why not the United States? So the Libra Association is an independent association. We, we're trying to set up a global payment system uh, Switzerland is where a lot of the international organizations are. Uh, it, it also is there greater regulatory certainty in Switzerland than in, here in the United States for this type of technology? Um, I, I think Switzerland has certainly been forward-leaning on wanting to work through systems like this. But, but I don't want this to, to come across as if... And the United States is not. Well, Congressman, I, one of the things that I just want to be clear on is that the Independent Libra Association is... It's independent, we're a part of it, we helped stand it up, we don't control it. Um, but I, I just want to make sure it's 100% clear to everyone today that my commitment running Facebook is that we're not going to launch anything that is a, a product or a part of this until we have full support from U.S. regulators, regardless of what the international so the, regulators The project of Libra internally, before you handed this technology, this idea over to the association, let's think of this. Um, why would you have a project like that? Is it about competition uh, with your peers globally? Is, is that a component? So, sorry, I didn't hear that. So you have no payments platform on Facebook. Facebook is not a payments platform. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So in seeking to develop a payments platform internally, before you handed the technology over to the association for Libra, was that because of examples globally of competitors creating payments platforms. Congressman, it was partially that, and it's partially because I view the financial infrastructure in the United States as outdated. So there, there, are, there are two sets of work that we do. 
um, on payments. One is building payment systems um, that allow people to send money on top of the existing financial system that exists. Uh, that work is relatively less controversial. Um, we're doing it around the world in, in different countries uh, on top of existing payment systems. There's another set of work, which is what we're trying to do with Libra, which is trying to help rethink what a modern um, infrastructure for the, for the financial system would be if you, if you started it uh, today rather than you know, 50 years ago with, on, on a lot of outdated systems. I, mean, I just look at you know, the fact that you can send a text message to someone around the world. Okay, but um, let, me, let me just drill down on this. Alipay has 900 million users. That is a global competitor, in my view, to Facebook. Uh, you see Alipay and WeChat Pay working. Why not just do a Facebook version of Alipay in order to level this? Uh, Congressman, I think you're, you're right that they're certainly competing, not just with us, but all of the American companies on this. Uh, part of the infrastructure that they're building on is a lot more modern than, um, than, than some of what we would have to build on here. You know, the, the, as soon as uh, we put forward the, the white paper around the Libra project, um, China immediately announced a public-private partnership uh, working with companies like that to extend the, the work that they had already done with Alipay into a digital renminbi as part of the Belt and Road Initiative that they have. Uh, and they're planning on launching that in the next few months. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, you said, uh, and on page three of your testimony, that Facebook will not be part of launching Libra anywhere in the world until all the U.S. regulators approve. So which U.S. regulators are you talking about? Uh, there are actually many financial reg regulators, uh, such as the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, the SEC, the F CFTC, the CFPB, FinCEN, FHFA, and many, many more. And to be clear, Libra would affect all of those regulators. So which of those regulators do you believe need to approve Libra before you will support the launch? And what kind of approval do you believe is necessary? Do you need to see written approval from each regulator? Will those approvals be public? Uh, Congresswoman, thanks for the, the, the question. Um, my understanding is, is probably all of them for different things. Different of these regulators focus on different areas, whether it's financial stability um, or uh, fighting crimes and fraud and terrorism. Um, different, different areas of the work need to, need to get done and are overseen by different regulators. Uh, I, I think the processes with each of them might be a little bit different, uh, but we're committed to getting all of the appropriate U.S. approvals before launching uh, the Libra payment system in any country in the world, even where those approvals might not be strictly required. Just to be clear, will you commit to waiting until you get approval from every U.S. regulator that Libra affects before you'll support launching Libra? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, all of the regulators that have jurisdiction over a part of what we're doing, we, we are, are working with them and we'll, we'll seek approval from. Okay. Um, a bill of mine passed uh, the House yesterday which would crack down on anonymous shell companies in the United States, uh, which has become a nightmare for law enforcement. They are the perfect uh, vehicle for laundering money and for terrorism financing and criminal activity. Now with the creation of various digital currencies, we face a new challenge with financial uh, transactions being anonymous. That's why I am concerned that the use of anonymous wallets would make Libra attractive to those that are looking to launder money. It's my understanding that Calibra wallet won't be anonymous, but I haven't heard anything about competing uh, wallets. So will you commit not to supporting any other anonymous wallets for Libra? I consider this a national security issue. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for this question. I think it builds on a question that the chairwoman was asking before as well about our position on, on cryptocurrencies overall. Well, well, we, we see a range of different cryptocurrency projects out there, from completely decentralized and deregulated things 
to what we're trying to do is, is trying to build a, a safe and secure and a regulated alternative. We think that the, the digital payment space needs that. Of course, as, as a big company, we're not going to do something that's, that's unregulated or decentralized. We're going to work with the government uh, to build something that gets to the, the same standard on anti-money laundering and, and um, CFT uh, that, that all of the, the other world-class payment systems have or exceed those standards. Um, sorry, I, I forgot the actual question. I yeah. was caught up in answering the chairwoman's question. Uh, what, well, I, I don't think you have, um, you can have strong anti-money laundering controls and anonymous wallets. Right. So I see this as a new loophole uh, for criminals looking to hide and launder money. So what is your position on anonymous wallets? Will you commit that you won't have anonymous wallets, that it be transparent? Otherwise, we'll face the problems that we have with the LLCs where they are hiding trafficking money, uh, 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 terrorism financing, uh, criminal activity of all kinds. Uh, it's a huge problem for safety for Americans and it's a huge problem for law enforcement. This is their number one concern was this bill we passed yesterday um, with bipartisan support, um, but you're creating a whole new currency that, that could potentially be anonymous and could hide all types of criminal activity, which is a huge concern to the safety of Americans and national security. Yes, Congresswoman, I will commit that Facebook will do what you are saying. Uh, our version of this, our wallet is going to have um, strong identity, uh, is, is going to uh, work with all the regulators to, to make sure that we are at the, the standard of, of AML and CFT that people expect or exceed it. Um, I, I can't sit here and speak for the whole independent Libra Association, but you have my commitment from Thank Facebook. Thank you very much, and I yield back. The gentleman from Missouri, uh, the gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. When Libra was announced, 28 companies joined as founding members by signing a non-binding letter of intent to join the association. But in recent weeks, many of these founding members have dropped out of the association. Perhaps they're not uh, so sure it's going to work either. Uh, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, Stripe, Bookings Holdings, eBay, and Mercado Pago, law uh, they've, they've lost these, you've lost these stable partners, I would say, and I find it highly concerning. Very briefly, what, what do you make of these sudden departures from the association, and why do a number of these founding members have concerns that, it, that whether you're up to the task of meeting our money laundering and regulatory standards? Congresswoman, thanks for the, the, the question. And this, is a, this project is too big for any one company to do on its own, which is why we, we set up this independent Libra Association with a number of other companies and nonprofits. Um, it's it's very it's a very complex project and 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 as you say it's risky. Why have they departed? Num I just wrote scores of of stable partners have dropped out. Why? Well, Congresswoman, I think you you'd have to ask them specifically for. Why for do their, you think they dropped out? Uh, I, I think because it's a it's a risky project and I think that there's been a lot of scrutiny. Yes, it's a risky project. So let me move on to something that's near and dear to my heart. As you may know. I wrote and passed H.R. 1865, the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, widely known as FOSTA-SESTA. I am committed to rooting out online sex trafficking and believe that what is illegal offline should indeed be illegal online. Three weeks ago, the New York Times ran a report titled, The Internet is Overrun with Images of Child Sex Abuse. And I'd like this uh, submitted for the record. Without objection, 16.8 million, 16.8 million, as confirmed by the Department of Justice, of the 18.4 million worldwide reports of child sexual abuse material are on Facebook. 16.8 of the 18.4 million. These 18.4 million reports from last year included a record 45 million photos and videos. 
These are absolutely shocking numbers. Moreover, it's estimated that 70% of Facebook's valuable reporting to NCMEC, the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children, would be lost if Facebook implements its end-to-end -end encryption proposal. Mr. Zuckerberg, how much is this figure growing year after year? And if, if you enact end-to-end -end encryption, what will become of the children who will be harmed as a result that they're not reported? Congresswoman, thanks. Uh, child exploitation is, is, uh, is one of the ser most serious threats that we, that we focus on. What is Facebook doing? 16.8 of the 18.4 oh. million. Well, Congresswoman, the reason those reports come from Facebook. I don't, the, the reason why there is the vast majority come from Facebook is because I think we work harder than any other company to identify this behavior and report what it to you do, are you and doing and to FBI. shut this down? Uh, these accounts peddle horrific illegal content that exploits women and children. What are you doing, Mr. Zuckerberg, to shut this down? Well, Congresswoman, we, we build sophisticated systems to find this behavior. 16.8 million and growing? Of the 18.4 images? Well, Congresswoman, I don't think Facebook is the only place on the Internet where this behavior is happening. I think the fact that the vast majority of those reports come from us reflects the fact that we actually do a better job than everyone else of finding it and, and, and acting on it. Um, and, and you're right that, that in an end-to-end -end encrypted world, um, one of the risks that I'm worried about, uh, among others, to safety is that it will be harder to find some of this behavior. But you have said you want end-to-end -end encryption. What's going to happen for the, of these children? They won't be reported then. And you are responsible. Facebook is responsible for 16.8 million of the 18.4 well, that are out there year, again, last year alone. Again, I, I believe that there are probably a lot more than 18 million out there, and I think we're, we're doing a good job of finding this. Um, but. I, I think you're right that in, in What are you going to do to shut it down, Mr. Zuckerberg? We're working with law enforcement and building technical systems to identify. Well, you're not working hard, to, hard enough, sir. And end to end encryption is not going to help the reporting process. I'm, I'm uh, over my time. I have many more questions for you that I'll submit for the record. But we're going to talk about this, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Zuckerberg, Calibra has pledged it will not share account information or fin financial data with Facebook or any third party without customer consent. However, Facebook has had a history of problems safeguarding users' data. In July, Facebook was forced to pay a $5 billion fine to the FTC, by far the largest penalty ever imposed to a company for violating consumers' privacy rights as part of a settlement related to the 2018 Cambridge Analytical scandal. So let me start off by asking you a very simple question. Why should we believe what you and Calibra are saying about protecting customer privacy and financial data? Well, Congresswoman, uh, I think that this is a, a, an important question for us on all of the new services that we build. Um, we certainly have work to do to, to build trust. I think that the settlement and order that we entered into with the FTC uh, will help us set a new standard for our industry in terms of the rigor for the privacy program that we're building. We're now basically building out uh, a privacy program for people's data that is, that is parallel to what the Sarbanes-Oxley requirements would be for a public company on people's financial data. Okay. Uh, in terms of audits internally, um, any manager who's, who's overseeing a team uh, that, that, that uh, handles people's data has to certify quarterly uh, that, that they're meeting their commitments, and that goes all the way up to me, and I'll have to certify that on... on, on Thank you for your answer. Uh, it has been publicly reported That's uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg appearing before the House Financial Services Committee in Washington, D.C., answering questions about uh, Facebook's impact on the financial services and housing sectors, and, of course, the focus being Project Libra. The company's embattled initiative to launch a global cryptocurrency. And with that, uh, we are taking a short breather here.